Fairwegen Street in Stockholm. Two gunshots have been fired. They've killed the Prime Minister, Olaf Pang. I'm convinced there was no conspiracy. This crime was committed by a single person. Over the last 15 years, investigators have come to the same conclusion. But have there been mistakes in their inquiries? This is the last photograph of Olaf Palm, the Swedish Prime Minister, taken just hours before his death. On the 28th of February 1986, John Walbage carried out the photo session in the Premier's office. We shook hands and bade our farewells. And he said, I see your name is on the list of people who will accompany me to Moscow. I replied, yes, exactly. And he said, so we'll meet again in Moscow, if not before. And then we parted. And how did you find him? He was in good form. He was laughing and joking. On that Friday, there was a happy, relaxed atmosphere at Rosenbad, the seat of government in Sweden. Olof Palm was about to take a weekend off, something of a rarity. At 5.30, he returned to his home at Gamla Stan in the old quarter of Stockholm. As usual, he had no bodyguard. Palm wouldn't give up his close contact with the people and had always refused personal protection. He wanted to live normally. Palm was ever willing to chat and to share his ideas on social democracy. A man of the people, he'd been able to implement some of his ideas. Palm was highly charismatic and had the ability to galvanize those around him. It was impossible to be indifferent to him. While most people appreciated his forthrightness, it also brought him many enemies. Whether at the Kremlin or the White House, Palm never held back from taking a strong personal line. He vigorously condemned, for example, the American stance on Vietnam, even going as far as to denounce the bombing of towns and villages as one of the worst crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. Palm was also an ardent defender of the Third World. He maintained excellent personal contact with Ortega, Castro and Arafat. His stance on world affairs gained him many friends, but also an array of vehement enemies. His assassination therefore gave rise to much speculation. Suspicion was leveled at the CIA, then the KGB. Fingers were pointed at the Kurds, as well as an assortment of right-wing extremist groups, the Iranian secret police, and protagonists of apartheid in South Africa. However, the favorite theory of investigators was that this was the work of a lone assassin without any political links. But there is one more line of inquiry which merits special consideration. Night has fallen. Mr. and Mrs. Palm decide to go to the cinema. They are going by metro as always, and without a bodyguard. At 8.30, they leave their house, but at the same moment, Ulla Strombach is returning home from work. As I reached this spot, I heard a noise. As though someone had climbed over the grill there. A man passed by here, and I watched him. 
He passed behind me and stopped in front of this door. I said to myself, why is he stopping there? Twenty meters away, Mr. and Mrs. Pound were on the point of buying their metro tickets. There was another noise, and the man took something from his pocket. I made out that it was a walkie-talkie. Then he started speaking to someone. Other men equipped with walkie-talkies were also spotted between here and the Pound's house. In addition, just before the Pounds arrived at the entrance to Gamla Stan station, someone saw a man busy using a walkie-talkie, which he was trying to conceal in his jacket. The man behind the ticket desk noticed yet another character who seemed to be following the Pounds. And the Metro driver saw two men follow the Prime Minister and his wife onto the train. So by the time the train left the station, nine unusual occurrences had been noted by various witnesses. The cinema was situated on a street called Sviavagen between the second and third metro stops. In the area immediately surrounding the second metro stop, witnesses would later claim to have spotted yet more men equipped with walkie-talkies. But Mr. and Mrs. Palmer decided to get off at the third stop, Rodsmangatan Station, and walk back away to the cinema. The driver noted that the two men who followed them onto the train also alighted behind them. It seems that whichever stop and whichever direction the Palms took, they would be under close surveillance, and also as they bought their cinema tickets and watched the film. The film finished at 10 past 11, and the Palms decided to walk home. Near the cinema, Saniva Thelestan noted a policeman. She thought it strange that he was not using his normal police handset, but a walkie-talkie. So she took note of the police car's registration, remembering only the last three numbers, 520. She heard the policeman say, OK, on this side. Then the patrol car sped off. Eleven seventeen, several streets further on towards the Palms' home. A witness, who we'll call Jerka, is walking along with his girlfriend. He spots a familiar face on the other side of the road, just by the gates of a cemetery. It is a local policeman, Thomas Lind. This is a reenactment. Lind is closely observing the street corner, walkie-talkie in hand. Mr. and Mrs. Palm pass by him at precisely 11.18. Then the couple cross the road because Mrs. Palm wants to look into a shop window. 200 meters away, another witness, Christian, is also on his way home. He notices two men, again with walkie-talkies, hanging around in front of an empty shop. This is unusual, and Christian is a little afraid because no one else is about. Later, he reports what he has seen to the police. He wasn't aware at the time that one of these men was a policeman himself. Soon afterwards, Christian starts to receive threatening phone calls. 11.20. The Palms continue on their way along Svevigan Street. These are the last few meters that Olaf Palm will ever walk. At the corner of Tunnel Gatan, he passes Decorima, a store which sells paint. A man has been waiting there on the doorstep for the past three minutes. It is exactly 11.21. Pan passes him. His wife is a couple of steps ahead. The man steps out and fires two shots. Pan is hit from close range. Olof Pan dies instantly. My name is Gusta Söderström. I was a policeman, but I've taken retirement. I was still in service when Olaf Palm was assassinated. 
My patrol car was parked there, and uh, Olaf Palm was struck down here. There were 10 or 12 people around him, and a couple of them were trying to save him with mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and cardiac massage. Among the bystanders, there was a man shouting, he ran off that way. The killer fled up 89 steps to reach Malmskidnadsgatan. One of the witnesses sets off in pursuit, but he loses the trail of the man on David Begara's gutter. Incredibly, the street is totally deserted. Suddenly, he is blinded by the headlights of a police car, which slowly passes him by. He flags it down. Later, he reports that the registration number ends with the numbers 520. Three minutes after the shots were fired, press photographer Acker Malmström spends his nights monitoring the police communications waveband so he can race to the scene if anything newsworthy happens. On his radio scanner, he intercepts a conversation taking place on walkie-talkies. I was sitting in my car and had switched on my telephone and the radio as usual. I heard this conversation. Hello up there. How are you doing? It's cold, someone replied. And then the first voice continued. The prime minister has been killed. Then nothing. Not a sound. Radio communications play an important part in the events of that night. So many men with walkie-talkies, two of whom were in full sight of the crime scene. From the moment that Olaf Palm left the cinema, more than a dozen men were seen hanging around sending radio messages. The trail of the assassin was lost not far from one group who were equipped with walkie-talkies. It is 11.25. 500 meters from the place where Olaf Palm's body lies sprawled on the pavement, a number 43 bus approaches the stop at Eriksberg's Gatton. Two men, agitated and out of breath, are waiting for it. Their behavior is strange. Later, the bus driver and two of the passengers identify them. They are Thomas Lind and Niels Horn. Thomas Lind was the police officer who'd been spotted seven minutes earlier by the cemetery. Niels Holm was also a policeman. The two had been part of a special squad which handled petty crime. The squad was nicknamed the Baseball League and the majority of its members were linked to the extreme right. Lind and Holm had been accused of police brutality time and again, but none of the incidents were followed up in spite of enormous public outrage against the activities of the Baseball League. The journalist, Ola Minel, had investigated this special police squad and had followed the careers of its members. In 1983, the squad had to be broken up because it had become uncontrollable. Since then, the police force of normal was reformed into two groups, League A and League B, and the members of the Baseball League were incorporated into both. Normal police is an important division in Stockholm. It's based in the Normal district close to the seat of government. Several officers who have sympathies with the extreme right are part of this division. In general, the Swedish police have leanings towards the Social Democrats, of whom Olof Palm was the leader. At the beginning of the 80s, the extremist of the right in the police force tended to be the youngest and the most brutal. That's how their colleagues perceived them. They were a law unto themselves and organized special evenings which they called friendship nights. And what did they used to do? 
There, they'd listen to invited fascist guest speakers who spouted extreme right policies. Then they'd all dance to German military music. They even adopted the Hitler salute. Only hours after the assassination, League A of the normal police held such an evening. According to several witnesses, the officer who presided even proposed a toast to the murder of Palm, and nobody raised objections. Obliged to explain, this chief said that in his way, he had been paying tribute to the good work of his men on the night of the murder. Because this was an evening held in private, no inquiry was ever carried out on this chief or his associates. The day of the killing, Hans Holmer, Stockholm's overall police chief, took charge of the murder inquiry. This was the same man who had created the baseball league and who'd been proud of the squad's work. Holmer had equipped them with automatic weapons, which are banned in Sweden. They must have been acquired illegally. He even fitted his office with bulletproof windows without the permission of his superiors. Holmer obtained the windows, the weapons, and a large stock of walkie talkies from a certain P.J. Karlstrom, a former police officer, a man of the extreme right who'd become an arms dealer. There are many photographs in existence which show him executing the Hitler salute, some taken in front of the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin. In his arsenal, the same type of bullets which killed Palm could be found. Karlström had been in hospital after an appendicitis operation, but signed himself out on the day of the murder against the advice of his doctor. That night, he's known to have made contact at least twice with one of the mysterious characters who carried walkie-talkies. An internal police dossier profiles Karlström as cold, insensitive, and perfectly capable of murder. One of his company offices is situated in this building on the route the killer took to flee the scene. It was around here that the witness who'd given chase lost the trail. The prosecutor in charge of the affair would exclaim in 1994 that Karlstrom had no alibi for the time of the crime, but no inquiry was made against Karlstrom because he was supposed to be in hospital on that day. The house just opposite. Two of the men with walkie-talkies had taken up position just in front. A colleague of Karlstrom lives there. Both he and Karlstrom are members of the same gun club. Bjorn Skogsfeld, the club's shooting instructor, is also an extremist who especially idolized the Chilean junta. The night of the murder, he was in police car number 3230. It wasn't a regular squad car but he'd used it to go and move his own private car because it was parked illegally. He'd only been able to find a second parking spot, which was also illegal. That's how he'd found himself close to the murder scene. During the time he moved his own car, he'd left police car 3230 at the head of the stairway that the killer took during his escape. It precisely overlooks the scene of the shooting. And it's exactly where Skogsfeld's personal car was parked that the witness in pursuit saw the fleeing killer for the last time. At the moment the shots were fired, Skogsfeld got into the police car and drove off. The circumstances surrounding the bullets which killed Olaf Palm are equally strange. One of them wasn't found until 37 hours after the murder, yet it was only four meters away from where Palm had fallen. The second bullet was found immediately and was taken as evidence by one of the investigating policemen. Both bullets had been cleaned before being finally presented to the laboratory. This is the information sheet put out by the head of the police inquiry. It reads 2323, the first alert. Ten seconds later, the first squad car arrives on the scene. This is in total contradiction with the witness statement given by Leif Lundqvist. He tried to call the emergency number from his car immediately after hearing the shots. 
Ja, det är mot på trevägen. Prata med polisen. Lundqvist was put on hold for 80 seconds. When an officer finally responded, the line was cut, apparently by a third person. The office of the head of police communications is in the same building as that of the arms dealer Kolström. There are photographs of this police communications chief also making the Hitler salute, and he's also a member of the same shooting club. Hans Zetterland was on duty at the police radio communication center. This is unusual. Normally, he's on patrol in vehicle 3230, the same car that was parked on the killer's getaway route just before the murder. He too is a member of the gun club. Emergency calls take priority over all others, but Zetterland doesn't take this into account. He replies to a call from a taxi rank rather than calls from the murder scene. When the taxi driver reports gunshots, Zetterland hangs up. It seems that Han Zetterland went even further in delaying response to the assassination. Brothers Kari and Perti Puitinen, two information technology specialists, have made inquiries into the dysfunction at the police radio center and interviewed Han Zetterland. He didn't even call an ambulance, although he knew that a man had been shot down. He didn't report the incident as the rules require. Equally, he didn't inform the superior officer in charge that evening. The emergency services were astounded that the police hadn't called an ambulance to the scene. Their call was recorded. You're not aware of what happened? Reply, no, we haven't received any calls. That call was made two minutes after the police are known to have arrived on the scene. The lack of police response was astounding. An alert was certainly given at that time, but it concerned a Volvo which was being driven dangerously. When a crime involves a firearm, the alert number one should be broadcast and repeated at regular intervals. What happened on this occasion was exactly the opposite. Zetterland had three levels of alert to choose from, but he opted for the lowest priority level for the murder. Alerts are normally destined for all the on-duty officers and regulations stipulate they should be repeated for those who don't hear it the first time round, or for those whose radios have been switched off for a while. But in this case, the alert was not repeated on the regular wave band. In fact, it was only retransmitted on a special frequency. Consequently, only those police patrols who heard the first broadcast were aware of the situation. So the majority of the response force available in the city center were completely unaware of what had befallen their prime minister. And none of these divisions elsewhere in the city were alerted. At Solna, for example, only two kilometers from the crime scene, no one got the news until much later. So no one was out hunting the killer. Bus and taxi drivers knew more of what was going on than the police did. No orders came from police headquarters. In violation of all the rules, only two police phone operators were handling calls relating to the murder. The eight others on duty continued to handle mundane, non-urgent calls. The first officer to arrive at the scene confirms that the official registers have been falsified. I'm ready to swear on the Bible that I arrived at 11.30. According to the official version, I'm supposed to have got there at 11.23. This question has tormented me for years, and I am able to prove what I say, and that the official register is inaccurate. The register, which notes the moment of police intervention, is full of errors. Police car number 3230 is supposed to have been alerted at 11.23 and to have arrived only seconds later. That's to say seven minutes before Gosta Soderstrom. But the radio communications center acknowledges that it indeed it was Gosta who was the first officer to arrive. The contradiction is flagrant. 
This affair was wrapped in the greatest secrecy. I asked to reread the report that I myself had made that evening. My request was refused, but they showed me a typewritten report which stated that at exactly 11.23, 14 police vehicles had received the alert signal. That is totally false. Another contradiction. The control report sheet listing police action is equally strange. The original has disappeared, but we've managed to trace a copy. Age said, the initials of Hans Etterland, indicating that he had sent the first patrol car to the murder scene at 11.23. But note, the initials are preceded by a star. When a police officer enters an alert time into the system which differs by more than seven minutes from the real time, marked by the police station's central clock, the computer automatically inserts a star alongside. So why falsify the time of the alert? Could it mean that someone allowed seven minutes to pass to allow the killer to make his getaway? Or could it simply imply that the police, in place of their official radios, were using walkie-talkies? It was on the walkie-talkie channel that photographer Ake Malmström heard about the murder of the Prime Minister. It proves that at least one official police message was passed by walkie-talkie. To this day, no one's been able to establish who made that call. The driver of the police car, whose number ends with 520, was parked under the window of a witness, Suniver Telestan. He saw that this policeman too was using a walkie-talkie. The registration number of the car was finally certified to be 1520, the same car which was stopped by the witness who'd pursued the killer. The witness asked the police team in this car to try and catch the killer. They said they would try, although at that moment they couldn't yet have been officially informed of the murder. The radio message supposedly hadn't been made. The driver of this patrol car was also a member of the extreme right. At no time were the police to interview the many witnesses who were around. The Danish secret police, the SAPO, were given the task of following the leads which directly implicated the police force in the affair. The SAPO was created under the German Gestapo in the 1940s and had since been criticized for having affinities with the extreme right. Many members of the SAPO are on record as having voiced antipathy for Olaf Palm. In the 1970s, the director of the SAPO was none other than Hans Holmer, the founder of the Baseball League. Several indications lead us to believe that the SAPO knew of an assassination plan before it took place. But in this affair, it appears that despite the indications that point directly at them, the police have been protected. It was journalists who found and interviewed the witnesses, not the police. The many witnesses were never taken seriously by the authorities. Some have been intimidated and threatened and live in fear even today. We go back to one minute before the assassination. The two witnesses who saw the killer lurking in the shop doorway still refuse to appear before the camera. But at the time, they explained what they'd saw to journalist Ola Olsen. Katja and Pirio were returning home after seeing a film at Kungsgarten. They had to pass this place here. Katja asked Pirio for the time, but she had forgotten her watch. So Katja approached a man in the street and asked the time. As it turned out, she recognized him. He was Finnish and he worked for a fitness center in Uplands, Bosby. She asked him in Finnish if it was very late. He gave her a shocked look and didn't reply. Angrily, she took him by the arm and asked him why he refused to give her the time. The man stood there, his arms crossed, and at the moment she heard a noise. He drew his arms away, and she saw that he had a walkie-talkie in one hand. More shocking, she glimpsed that he had a pistol holstered under the other arm. From the walkie-talkie came a voice. They're coming. The man replied in Finnish. I've been spotted. What shall I do? 
And a voice replied, hard luck, continue as planned. The two girls were astonished. They didn't understand what was going on and headed off. Who was the man with a Finnish accent who'd spoken into the walkie-talkie? Katia and Pirio were just two blocks further on when they heard the gunshots. They looked back but saw nothing. Frightened, they ran to the nearest metro station. They returned home to the Uplands of Osby district. And the following morning, they heard on the radio what had happened to the Prime Minister. In this same suburb, there's a fitness training centre called the Vosby Athlete Club. It's a place where many Finnish people come to spend time together. It's here that they first encountered the man who they'd run into in front of the Decorama store just before the murder. It was his behavior at the club that had marked him out in their minds. He joked with other Finns, and he made remarks about those who were training, but he never trained himself. Katia still remembers the racist remarks which he was in the habit of making, but she cannot or will not give his name. But he was well known at the sports club. Many people trained here, and Katia insists that everyone knew the name of the character in question. But the police insist that it has been impossible to identify and find him. I think that's a lie. They have their reasons for not tracing him. Well, at least up till now. For years, Hans Olverbro has been in charge of the murder inquiry. Nine years. From the beginning, his position was the following. We had to find out the motives for the killing. The only line of inquiry which I refuse to follow is that which leads to the police force. At the time, we conducted our inquiries completely objectively, and we have made enough progress to be able to assure you that there was no conspiracy. If you talk about the police inquiries, well, there's always a public aversion to what the police do. All the accusations have no substance. They have nothing to do with the reality. If that's the case, how can the strange behavior of the patrolling police be explained and the falsification of police documents? My job is not to make inquiries about the police force. It is to arrest the killer of Olaf Palm. But has no inquiry ever linked the assassination to the police force? Sweden is a great democracy, and so we have a democratic and efficient police force. Half the police officers are social democrats. Do you really believe us capable as democrats of killing our own prime minister? We are there to protect our citizens. One of the main members of the investigation team is also a member of the shooting club. Hans Holmer is a social democrat who seems to get on very well with the right-wing extremists. On the night of the murder, Hans Holmer says he was here in the town of Borlong, which is about 200 kilometers from Stockholm, staying in this hotel. But is it true? In 1990, the hotel receptionist received an order don't talk to people who ask questions about this. The journalist Sven Anna, who's written five books on the death of Palm, spoke to her before she received the order not to talk. I came here in the autumn of 1987 and made inquiries in all the hotels. Hans Holmer didn't spend the night in any of them. In the spring of 1987, the receptionist May London, who works in this hotel, confirmed to me that he wasn't on the hotel register. I've checked the registers of all the hotels for this day, and Hans Holmer doesn't appear anywhere. So nobody saw Holmer in the town, 
but this was his alibi. Homer has recounted how he got up at 7.35 in the morning, went down to reception and asked for hot water to make some tea. He says it was the receptionist who informed him of the assassination the night before. Carl Nordlung works with a local printing firm. Out of personal interest, he's made his own investigation. The duty receptionist on that night was Raiden Andreasen. She confirmed she never saw Hans Homer. The story of Homer's search for hot water doesn't ring true either. Anyone can ask for hot water at the reception desk until 7 in the morning. After that, when Homer says he asked for the water, the breakfast room is already open and the reception desk doesn't give hot water anymore. Later, Hans Holmer made available to inquirers the documents which were supposed to prove he had passed the night at Bolang. But can they be believed? The name of the town doesn't appear on any of his bills. You can pick up identical bills from any hotel belonging to the Scandic Hotel Group. In the case of Hans Holmer, the credit card chit carries the initials of a receptionist who wasn't even on duty at the time. Another point about the hotel bill. Instead of the date March the 1st, when he supposedly paid, the bill is dated the day before, the 28th of February, the day of the murder. The question remains, where was Hans Holmer at the time of the assassination? He was apparently seen at police headquarters at the time he claimed to be in Bolang. And later that night, not far from the murder scene, a high-ranking policeman testified that he passed Holmer and was astonished when Holmer didn't return his greeting. In addition, there's the word of Holmer's driver. Rolf Dahlgren was a trainer of elite parachute commandos before becoming a chauffeur for important politicians and high-ranking members of the Secret Service, the SAPO. Rolf Dahlgren died in May 1994, but his companion, Lilian Folt, was also a member of the police force. She remembers only too well what he said about the night of the Prime Minister's murder. During a visit to Rolf, Ulla Ankerspong, a lawyer from Gothenburg, and I asked a lot of questions about the murder of Palm. Rolf told us that he and Homer arrived at the crime scene seven minutes after the shooting. Police Chief Soderstrom confirms that Homer was in a patrol car which passed the murder spot seven minutes after the crime took place. I telephoned Rolf Dahlgren to verify the statement made by the woman Lillian Falk about the arrival time of the police car and he confirmed it. This is the record of the working hours of Rolf Dahlgren. Details concerning the night of the murder have been removed. Even the word Friday has been scratched out as though this day had never existed. Since the very beginning Hans Holmer concentrated his inquiry on a so-called Kurdish plot. Although there were no leads or any worthwhile information in this direction, he carried out a series of arrests and interrogations. He never bothered to ask for authority from a judge. He signed all the arrest documents himself. The rise of Hans Holmer in the police force had depended on his connections with the Social Democrat Party. It would have been impossible without the heavy political backup of the party leaders. The relationship between the leaders of the Social Democrats and the security forces was always rather special. After the death of Palm, the new government leader Ingvar Carlsson also backed Holmer, at least at the very beginning. But when Holmer realized that his theory about a Kurdish plot wasn't holding any water, he was forced to resign. Since then, the idea of a crazed lone killer has become the official line. Any question of police involvement remains completely taboo. So why should anybody be afraid of an exhaustive inquiry into the behavior of the security forces? It seems that there is a general fear that the naming of the real culprits of the murder of Olaf Palm could overturn the very foundations of Swedish society. Even the media haven't taken it upon themselves to delve further, with a singular exception, a TV program fronted by Lars Bornias.
He inquired exhaustively into the death of Pound. So why has the evident line of inquiry towards police involvement been so taboo? That's a difficult question. Traditionally, media reports which concern crimes are made hand in hand with the police. We show what the police are doing, but we never criticize the police. So the press never explored the trail which might have led them to the police. Politicians, too, never probed too deeply. Only one isolated voice, that of the former Minister of Finance, Kiel Olof Feld, was raised in the midst of a troubling silence. Disconcerted, in August 1995, he said that a possible police role in the killing should be taken seriously. There was no official reaction, but the events which followed were strange. The night after he intervened, two men were spotted on the roof of the home of the new Prime Minister, Ingvar Carlsen, directly above his bedroom. Is it coincidence that a new sport was launched that very night, mountaineering up the facades of people's houses? The man behind it was a member of the shooting club, a member of the police squad known as the Baseball League, and he was also a member of the Uplands Vosby Fitness Club. The Secret Service, the Sapo, had been responsible for the safety of Prime Ministers since the death of Olof Palm. But the two men on the roof of the Premier's home were only spotted, and the police alerted, thanks to the vigilance of a guard from a private security company who was working nearby. The two men were arrested, but there was no formal inquiry. The police totally rejected any implication that there could be a political motivation. But where were the Sapo officers who were supposed to be protecting Carlson? Only six hours after the incident, during a hastily called press conference, the new Prime Minister surprised the entire nation by announcing his resignation. He said it was for personal reasons. First had come the demand for a full and proper inquiry into the Palm murder from the former Minister of Finance. Then two men were on Carlson's roof, and then came his surprise resignation, all in the space of several hours. No one has made the connection between these events. Carlson never even took the time to nominate his successor. His deputy, Mona Salin, wasn't informed of his intention to resign until just before the press conference. In 1996, Ingvar Carlson abandoned politics altogether. The new prime minister, Goran Persson, was also a social democrat, but his ideas were far removed from those of Olaf Palm and Ingvar Carlson. In June 1999, a report was published which gave the findings of a commission aided by top-level analysts who'd been charged with inquiring into a possible police link in Palm's murder. Their work had taken years. But the report arrived at no concrete results and shed no light on the errors committed in the Palm affair. The track towards the police had not finally been followed up. No witnesses were questioned. However, their integrity was placed in doubt. No police officer was interviewed, but their integrity was never questioned. That is hardly surprising. It was the police themselves that selected the documents which were presented to the commission. This report is today gathering dust on the shelves of the Ministry of Justice. No one has taken further interest. And in 2011 comes the legal point in time when all inquiries must stop. On the 10th of September, 2003, another popular politician, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, was stabbed to death by a deranged assassin. Anna Lind was shopping at a Stockholm department store when the killer jumped out at her. In this affair, however, no apparent conspiracy made the mourning of her followers harder to bear. <laughs> Som 
Song.